Hey guys, we're here today to talk about Jack London and naturalism. I tried to sing that, that didn't do too well, but that's okay. So, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I say a few weeks ago, when really it was just last week, we talked about the Flying Day Gold Rush. I'm trying to find my um, handout. Why put it in there with you? It's right there. All right, so. You probably remember us talking about the Klondike Gold Rush. Went through, we, we underlined a bunch of stuff, yada, yada, yada. Can do the same thing this week with Jack London and that's what it is. Okay, so check it out. I'm going to I'm gonna read this out loud to you. You want to follow along with yours, highlight yours. I strongly suggest you do. Wink, wink, hint, hint. There's going to be an open note test just based on the Klondike Gold Rush and Jack London naturalism. Another article that we'll get to next week. Excuse me, I got the hiccups <coughs> through my throat. So check it. <coughs> Woo! Coughing now. Hashtag Rona. Don't want to cough. You know, we're reading the Call of the Wild right now. You guys are reading that online. Um, this is just the actual book I got. Written by Jack London. We talked about Jack London with the Gold Rush a little bit last week. Check it out. It says, Naturalism is a style of fiction in which characters are forged with their environment. Ooh, Zooey Mama. That sounds important. Let's highlight that. First introduced by the French writer Emily Zola in the 1880s, naturalism and extension realism was a reaction to the tenets of romanticism, which idealized emotion and adventure. While realism attempts to depict characters in their situations as truthfully as possible, naturalism moves beyond realistic descriptions to also address the psychological and evolutionary forces that contribute to a character's decision making. Characters must confront their limitations and adapt in a world that can be violent, powerful, and destructive. That sounds important too, so I'm going to highlight that right there. Once a minute ago, because I just printed it off. At the close of the 19th century, the typical setting for a novel might be a plush drawing room, pastoral farm, or gruesome battlefield. The ruthlessness of the ruthless wilderness in the Klondike was as unexplored in fiction as it was in reality. Ooh, that sounds important right there, okay? When Jack London began publishing stories in the Great White North, which is Alaska, like the son of the wolf, a daughter of the snows, a call of the wild, the sea wolf, a strong vivid prose brought the harsh living and hard decisions of the frontier into the imagination of the American readers. So in other words, Jack London, he's, you know, he literally uh, was part of the gold rush. He's writing these books about Alaska and this completely unexplored area of the world at that time in history, and people are like, oh, snap, let me read more of that, bruh. So that's part of the reason why he got so popular is because he was writing about areas that nobody really knew much about, so it was new and it was exciting, okay? Hardships in nature from London's characters to be flexible or forceful in order to survive and sometimes fail. So let's highlight that. Boom. After rejecting civilization in order to follow an inner intuition, characters like Buck function within Charles Darwin's construct of survival of the fittest. I'm going to highlight that part. A model made clear by the jockeying for dominance displayed by Buck, Dave, Solux, and Spitz. London's talent for naturalism is evident in his unsentimental view of his canine protagonists. Sarah S. Hudson, curator of the literary manuscripts of the Huntington, uh, the Huntington Library, notes that in choosing to the story through a dog's point of view, London could have skated very closely to anthropomorphism, but he never crossed the line. It's one of the crowning achievements to put you inside the mind of a dog and make it so realistic and have it ring so clear and so truthfully without ever crossing in the caricature. So... I'm going to highlight that, because that's true, because when we read Call of the Wild, Buck is not talking. He's not a talking dog. This is not a Disney movie where we hear Buck talk and everything. We don't even hear what he's thinking as well, but at the same time, we know what Buck is going through psychologically because of how well it was written. Um, there's a fancy word there. Let me grab my ink cool. called anthropomorphism, okay? This is not one of your vocab words. You don't. You're not required to know, but check it out. Anthropomorphism is very similar to like when you watch a Disney movie and the characters talk. Like if you're watching Finding Nemo, Nemo talks, Marlin talks, the sharks talk, uh, Dory talks, um, the little octopus is like, don't touch the butt. <gasps> you touch the butt. 
he talks. Um, they all, all the fish talk, or the turtle totally did. He talks in Finding Nemo. That's anthropomorphism when you have a talking animal in literature, okay? Um, and Buck never talks in the story. They even start off, the first sentence says Buck didn't read the newspaper. So dogs can't read and write. They can't talk. So that's what anthropomorphism is. We never go into that category with Call the Wild because it just doesn't happen, okay? Over here, Charles Darwin's uh, construct, Survival of the Fittest, um, you probably saw, notice began chapter 2, they talk about the law of the thing. So I'm going to write that in there. Law of the thing. And that's pretty much only the strong survive. Eat or be eaten. Survive by any means necessary. That's law of the thing. Also known as survival of the fittest. Okay? Alright, so last paragraph says, the landscape of the Klondike shaped the destiny of all who entered it, some leaving as Klondike kings and others heartbroken and penniless and still more perishing along the paths. London left the Klondike in 1898, and by the time of his death in 1916, he was one of America's highest paid writers. Ooh, yeah, how about that? I'm going to come back to the idea in just one thing. His naturalistic writings were not restricted to tales of the gold rush. His semi-autobiographical works, such as The Road and the People of the Abyss, explored issues of poverty and abuses of power. His work influenced a generation of human naturalists, including Upton Sinclair and Sinclair Lewis. I'm going to highlight these two, who continue to apply the naturalistic theory to naturalist theory to social issues and hopes of reform. Like London, they aspired to tell authentic stories about the realities of the American society from the bustling city to the farthest reaches of the Western terrain. All right, so this last paragraph, let's be honest, Upton Sinclair and Sinclair Lewis, you don't need to know anything about them, but wink, wink, hint, hint, when you see that open note test later on, those two names do pop up, so you want to highlight them just to know that they were inspired by Jack London. Well, look at this, y'all. He was one of America's highest paid writers. I'm pretty sure that's the American dream right there, right? To be able to do something that you love and get paid money to do it. That's the American dream right there. Like, if you want to be a rapper, like, your goal as a rapper is to make enough money to live off of so you can continue to rap. If you want to be a ballerina or a professional wrestling player, your goal is to make as much money as possible to live off of your passion of doing something that you love. So, Jack London was good at writing. He was passionate about writing. And when he died, he was one of America's highest paid writers. That is the dream right there, y'all. That is the American dream right there in just a few words. To be able to be paid to do something that you love to do every single day. Okay, so, you know, man, living the American dream. Literally living the American dream. So that's all about Jack London naturalism. Um, wink, wink, hint, hint. Hold on to this. Put inside your notebook. Uh, you will see this in a form of the new test later on, so please, please don't lose it. On the other side of this, you know, or excuse me, uh, here, here in class, I gave them a handout with, if you look at this, the Klondike Gorge was on one side, and then Jack London Naturalism was on the other side. You can see I, that was from Hulling in another class, but hold on to that, because you'll need it later on. Got any questions? Holler at me, me and them, advanced.org. In the meantime, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.